Hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program. I'm Marcia Eli from the Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History and the Arts and Culture Team, BPL Presents. Tonight, we have the privilege of hosting Sam Roberts in a conversation about his new book, The New Yorkers, 31 Remarkable People, 400 Years, and the Untold Biography of the World's Greatest City. Roberts is a 50-year veteran of New York journalism. He is currently an obituaries reporter and formerly the urban affairs correspondent at the New York Times. He has hosted the New York Times Close Up on CUNY TV and the podcasts Only in New York and The Caucus. He's also the author of A History of New York in 27 Buildings, A History of New York in 101 Objects, and Grand Central, How a Train Station Transformed America. His conversation partner tonight is journalist, NYU professor and author, Pamela Newkirk, whose work examines contemporary and historical depictions of African America, American popular culture. She is the author of numerous books, including Diversity Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, Spectacle, The Astonishing Life of Ota Benga, which was awarded the 2016 NAACP Image Award, and Within the Veil, Black Journalists, White Media, which won the National Press Club Award for Media Criticism and was recently optioned for a feature film. I'm very excited to hear what they have to say, but before I hand it over, I want to give a few quick notes to all of you. First, we have put or will put a link in the chat to a local Brooklyn bookstore, the community bookstore, so that you can explore the New Yorkers on your own. And if you so desire, purchase a copy from an independent business. Second, if you uh, so desire, you have the option for closed captioning tonight. You can just click that at the bottom of your screen. And finally, and most importantly, um, I hope you'll share your questions this evening. Type them throughout the program into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. And with that, it is my enormous honor to welcome you both. And thank you so much for being here. And I turn it over to you. Thank you, Marcia. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, Sam, congratulations on your book. Pamela, thank and, you, and thank you for agreeing to pummel me with questions. Oh, yes, I can't wait. <laughs> um, you know, as a fellow native New Yorker journalist um, and a journalist who also dabbles in history, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to discuss your fascinating new book. And in it, you narrate the history of our great city through the lives of 31 remarkable people most of whom are unknown or little known. And the book is just chock full of compelling and at times amusing facts about New York. So how did you come up with the idea for the book and how did you select the people, uh, most of whom, like I said, are unknown or little known? Well, Pamela, I had done, as uh, Marsha mentioned, a number of books about the city a uh, history of New York and 101 Objects, a history of New York and 27 Buildings, a book on Grand Central. And what I wanted to do, those were books about material objects. And what I wanted to do was a book about New York through people, uh, in effect, a biography of the city. Uh, and 31, of course, was an arbitrary number. Uh, I had many more, but the publisher said, you can only, <laughs> you know, as you well know, put so many words in a book these days, paper is expensive. And uh, what I was looking for were a number of criteria. One, that uh, they were transformative or were emblematic of some sort of transformation. Two, that they were quirky. They were interesting people. Three, that they were people that for the most part, most of us had never heard of. I consider myself something of a student of New York history, although I'm happy to say I learn something new almost every day. Uh, but I didn't know about almost all of the people in this book. Uh, also that they'd be dead, uh, because I think it was too early to really assess the impact of people who were still alive in terms of 
their overall impact uh, on history. So those were the really the criteria I used for picking the 31 people. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of people left on the chopping block who maybe will make it into a sequel. Uh, <laughs> but, but those are the ones who uh, I sort of picked for this project. And it took a great deal of fascinating research, old newspapers, uh, old magazines, uh, histories in which, you know, people were mentioned just in passing in a sentence, in a paragraph, in a phrase. And I went back and tried to dig up information on them. In some cases, there was none, uh, just a name. In others, you know, I found some obscure biography about them uh, that had been done in the 19th century or the 18th century, uh, and then they were forgotten. Virtually all of them had never received a, a obituary uh, in the New York Times. Uh, they were overlooked as the Times uh, column. <laughs> so now you can nominate them for that section. Exactly. <laughs> and some of them I'm going to try and catch up and do. Exactly. Uh, but it was just so fascinating that I thought they deserved belated recognition. Uh, and they had never gotten it because they were just intrinsically interesting people. Right. Well, I mean, you have so many of them. So let me start with two of the people who are among the few known New Yorkers um, in the book, and that's um, Andrew Green and John Jay. Tell us why you included them. Well, that's very interesting because you picked the right two. Uh, John Jay, of course, was governor of New York. He was uh, the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, he, as governor, emancipated the slaves, or at least outlawed slavery somewhat belatedly in 1827 in New York. But one thing he did that I had no idea about, and in all the biographies I could find of John Jay, this was absolutely never mentioned. Uh, John Jay came home from negotiating the treaty with Great Britain, ending the Revolutionary War. And Congress wanted him to become Secretary of State, Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Uh, this was in 1785. And John Jay said, wait a minute. You know, you're meeting in Trenton. This is the temporary capital of the United States. I'm a New Yorker. I don't want to spend my time in Trenton. If you want me to be Secretary of Foreign Affairs, I'll take the job under one condition. You move the capital of the United States to New York City. And why was this important? It was more than a personal decision. The British had occupied New York City during the revolution for seven years. They made a mess of the city. It was called Canvas Town because so much of the city had been burnt down. People were living in tents. The city was demolished. The city by any uh, uh, you know, assessment had very little chance of coming back. And by John Jay moving the capital to New York City in 1785, and then in 1789, after the Constitution was passed, and it became the first federal capital where George Washington was sworn in, where the first Congress met, where Congress passed what became known as the Bill of Rights. By moving the capital to New York City, New York City was revived. New York City became the leading city in the country. The very first census that was taken in 1790, it became the most populous city in the United States. And then, and I know this is sort of a contrarian view, in the end of 1790, the capital left. They moved off to Philadelphia and then on their way to that swamp on the Potomac, Washington, <laughs> D.C. Right. And I think that was good for New York City because it allowed New York City the freedom to become the capital of capital. And New York City grew almost every decade since then and became and remained the largest city in the country. And I think, you know, we owe a great deal of thanks for John Jay for allowing New York to become the biggest city, to become revitalized after the revolution, and then to grow on its own without being tied down by the federal bureaucracy. And he's totally unrecognized for that accomplishment. And that's why I put him in the book. Andrew and, Green, I'm trying to not, you know, filibuster here, but no. Andrew Green was a controller of New York. He was the parks commissioner. 
He really uh, deserves a great deal of credit for creating Central Park. Remember, this was valuable real estate in the middle of Manhattan. But one of the things he did from the very beginning was he had a vision of bringing together what became the five boroughs into greater New York. And that finally happened in 1898. Brooklyn still calls it uh, Brooklyn's greatest mistake. <laughs> and you know, we can argue whether that's true or not. But he created greater New York, bringing together uh, again, what became the five boroughs, linking Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island to the mainland through the Bronx, and brought together what became and remains the biggest city in the country, and deserves an enormous amount of credit, overcame incredible opposition, both from real estate interests in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, and what he did was politically brought together what the Brooklyn Bridge had done and what mass transit was doing through the subway system. And uh, again, he never got enough credit for that. And a fascinating uh, coda to that story was Andrew Green wound up getting murdered on Park Avenue right outside his home in a case of mistaken identity yeah. in uh, the early 20th century. Yeah. So again, a fascinating story personally, politically, uh, and, you know, these are things you just can't make up. And, you know, and, that's why yeah. it has to be in the New Yorkers. And how is Michael, it, and I, how is it that even today, there's really no um, public monument to Andrew Green? Like he's still, I mean, he is considered the father of <laughs> greater New York, but he's still like, where, where are the public monuments to Andrew Green? Well, unfortunately, the major monument at this moment is a bench in Central Park near a compost pile. Oh, but my God. He is, he is now getting a little bit more recognition in a park that's being renovated on the East River in the East 60s uh, and finally make it a little bit more recognition. You're right. He is the father of Greater New York and deserves a lot more recognition than he's ever received until now. Yeah. So I had never heard of Evacuation Day, but you said it was celebrated for decades. Uh, what is Evacuation Day and why and when did it fall out of favor? Well, Pamela, it's a wacky name. Uh, it's a name from the perspective of the British. They evacuated the city in 1783. Uh, this was again belated. They surrendered uh, in 1781, it took them two years to get out of town uh, in New York. Uh, evacuation Day was celebrated on November 25th, all through the beginning of the 21st century. It was celebrated uh, largely through the impetus of the Irish immigrants in the 19th century, who had another reason to dislike the British. Uh, they left town, they nailed the Union Jack to a flagpole in Bowling Green, and they greased the flagpole so the Americans couldn't climb up and take the Union Jack down. But a uh, former prisoner of war named John Van Arsdale put cleats on, climbed the flagpole, and managed to tear down the Union Jack and put up the Stars and Stripes. The British fired what was the last shot of the uh, revolution from a man of war in New York Harbor Fortunately, it just landed in the river uh, in a sort of defiant, spiteful gesture as they left town. George Washington came riding into New York on uh, a white horse as he bar hopped down from the Hudson Valley, and New York was emancipated. So it should have been called Emancipation Day, uh, but it was called Evacuation Day, and it was celebrated until the early 20th century. Uh, it was celebrated last as an official holiday by the mayor in 1916. And then, of course, during World War I, when the British became an ally, it sort of fell out of favor. It's still celebrated in Boston because it uh, coincides with St. Patrick's Day. Uh, but New York, if you tell people November 25th is uh, evacuation day, they will look at you in a vacuous way and say, <laughs> What are you talking about? Yeah, I certainly had never heard of it. Um, so, I mean, there's so much in the book like that. I often associate Quakerism with Pennsylvania, but you introduced John Bowne. Um, tell us about Bowne and why you thought he merited attention. 
Well, he merited attention uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, the Quakers were overlooked because they submitted a petition uh, to Congress, that first Congress that was meeting here in 1789 to abolish slavery. Uh, it was ignored by Congress. It was uh, sent uh, with the blessing of Benjamin Franklin and Congress basically passed the buck and said, we're not gonna debate this. We're not gonna deal with it for at least another 20 years. But John Brown came before that. He came when uh, Peter Stuyvesant was still the governor general of Dutch New Amsterdam. And John Brown was English. He wasn't a Quaker at the time, but he defended the right of the Quakers in what was then Flushing, Queens to uh, express their religious freedom. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant threw him in jail, said, you know, the Quakers, even though we have a modicum of religious freedom in New Amsterdam, uh, we don't extend it to Quakers because they are really, you know, surrogates for the English. It was very interesting because when I did this book for New Yorkers, I discovered that what made New York distinct from every other colony in what became the United States, from colonies settled by the English, settled by the Dutch, by the Spaniards, settled by the French, was that the others came here to proselytize. They came here to escape religious persecution. The Dutch came here basically to make money. Make money. Exactly. And if you didn't get in their way, you were more or less accepted. Now, if you want to be an idealist, you can call it tolerance. If you want to be a cynic, you can call it indifference. But it distinguished what became New York to the rest of America, and it distinguished America to the rest of the world. Now, when Peter Stuyvesant said, no way am I going to put up with this, John Brown went to the West India Company in Amsterdam and said, whoa, wait a minute, you guys promised religious freedom, and you didn't do it for altruistic reasons, you did it for commercial reasons. And the West India Company basically said, you're right. Uh, in the interests of commerce, we're going to let you pretty much do what you want to do. Don't make a big deal of it. Don't make a fuss over it. But you could practice Quakerism in your own homes, at least. And he won this battle. And this was more than a century before the Bill of Rights was passed in New York. Uh, and we forget this. There is still a John uh, Brown House in Flushing, Queens. That was the birth of religious freedom. Uh, and that uh, Flushing Remonstrance sounds like something you would send to a plumber, but the <laughs> Flushing Remonstrance, which is in Albany, New York, it was recently on display in Federal Hall in New York, uh, was this first outburst of religious freedom. It was sent by the uh, people, not Quakers, but the English citizens of uh, Flushing, Queens to Peter Stuyvesant, he rejected it, but the Dutch West India Company said to them, you're right, or you have these rights. They weren't, you know, universal. They didn't extend to Catholics, but they established a, uh, a system of religious freedom, and they did two things that were very interesting. They extended it beyond uh, the Dutch Reformed Church, that was really the official church at the time, and they said that it was it was a negative thing to defy religious freedom, that God extended religious freedom to everyone. And uh, this heralded the Bill of Rights again by more than a century. And that's why I included him in the book. I thought he was a very important, though again, overlooked figure. Yes. Um, I was also surprised to learn who Delancey and Rivington, the namesakes of two well-known Lower Manhattan streets, were. So tell us what we should know but did not know about them. Well, it's very interesting. You know, when we talk about changing names, uh, changing names uh, because people were slaveholders, changing names because they might have been Confederate generals, you know, you could say, where does this stop? And it's a very good question. But, uh, you know, Delancey was a loyalist, certainly, and he, Delancey Street is still downtown. And you, do you change his name because yeah. he, he was a loyalist? Well, it would, con it would confuse those of us who grew up in New York. It <laughs> would change would. Delancey Street, but and, I didn't and, know he was a, a British loyalist. And <laughs> Rivington was a loyalist printer, Although now it turns out he might have been, might have been 
a spy for George Washington. Uh, mm -hmm. Might have been. Uh, we're still not sure. If you look at a CIA history of the revolution, it describes him as possibly a spy for uh, the colonialists, for the revolutionary movement. So the fact is, we really don't know. And if he was a spy, he might have done it for financial reasons. But he was a Tory printer, uh, printing propaganda for the British. Uh, but, you know, what it does and what I wanted to show through this book is how complicated history can be. Uh, I loved the line in Alan Bennett's play, The History Boys, when one of the kids is asked, how do you define history? And he thinks for a minute and he says in more or less these words, you know, it's one damn thing after another. <laughs> uh, well, Same. you know, that's as good a definition <laughs> as other as, as any. I'm more a believer in George Orwell's definition that, you know, who controls the past controls the future. I think history is very important. And unfortunately, we as New Yorkers don't seem to care about it. We are so consumed by the present and the future that we let other places like Philadelphia, like Boston, Boston like Jamestown, yeah. like Williamsburg, Virginia, like Washington, hijack our history. And we don't realize how important history is to New York. We don't That's, realize yeah. that it was the first capital, that it was where Washington was inaugurated, that it was where the first Congress met at the site of Federal Hall, that it was where the Bill of Rights was passed. And I think this is very important to our culture and to who we are as New Yorkers and Americans today. I agree. There's so few markers to those things, right? Um, and, and you mentioned Boston, and, and I, I was fascinated by your, your story about how Boston stole New York's thunder. So <laughs> talk about um, how do New York was denied its place in history for holding that legendary tea party. Well, there are two things. The Stamp Act Congress, you know, we think of the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act Congress was held in New York before the stamps became an issue in Boston. And the Tea Party, you know, this is sort of a quirk of history. And, you know, you can blame the weather for this. But <laughs> the Tea Party would have been held in New York before Boston, except the ship carrying the tea to New York got lost in a storm in the Caribbean. Uh, if it had made it here on time, it would have been called the New York Tea Party, not the Boston Tea Party. Again, one of those quirks of fate uh, that you only learn by looking back into history and studying it a little more carefully. It was not that the Bostonians were greater patriots or more radical than the New Yorkers. John Sears, one of the figures in this book, would have organized the Tea Party in New York before Boston, if only the ship had gotten here on time. You you sound a little competitive there, but okay. Well, I'm a little chauvinistic, I admit. It. <laughs> I'm a Brooklyn boy, so, you know. <laughs> and I never would have associated New York with pigs, but you write that in 1800, there was a pig for every five people. And as much as I had read about the, the infamous or famous Five Points area, I had never heard about what sounded like an infestation of pigs down there. So what was going on and how did that change? Well, it's funny, when foreigners thought of America, certainly the American West, they thought of Buffalo. But when they thought of American cities, they thought of pigs. And, John, and Charles Dickens wrote a great deal about pigs. And one of the people in my book is a man who challenged the city's attempt to regulate pigs. And he lost. He lost. And by losing, he established sort of a police power of the mayor and the city of New York in regulating not only pigs, but in effect, regulating urban planning. He lost that right. And it was a very interesting case because pigs were important to the city. People ate them, people raised them, people sold them, and they were all over the place. Uh, people let them roam free in the streets and they became a hazard to, to people walking, to people riding in carts and wagons. Uh, and the city just cracked down and said, you just can't do this anymore. It's interfering with transportation. It's interfering with people's lives. And 
by exercising that police power, it became a force of municipal uh, authority that was then extended to a lot of other police powers that the city was exercising. It took a while for that to go into effect. It took several decades, but that was in the 1820s and uh, really had an impact on uh, the municipal government in terms of what it could do, what it was allowed to do, and the power it was able to exercise over citizens in New York City. Wow. I loved your vivid account of New York Herald publisher James Gordon Bennett, whose son I mentioned in my book, Spectacle. But I didn't realize that Herald Square was named for the paper in the same way that Times Square was named for your great newspaper, the New York Times. So tell us, how did Bennett, Bennett and his Herald change American journalism? Well, Pamela, he did change it. Uh, uh, Charles Dana started the New York Sun, and it was the first of the penny papers, the first of the papers to actually sell around the city using newsboys. Uh, James Gordon Bennett, the New York Herald, did him one better. He really invented the modern concept of news, uh, not just gossip, but crime news, financial news, sports news, the kind of news that we uh, uh, know today. And it was funny because the New York Times... Uh, uh, it was um, uh, not Adolf Ox, but it was Henry Raymond. I'm just looking for the quote now. Henry Raymond, uh, who uh, ran the New York Times, when uh, when um, uh, James Gordon Bennett died, uh, he said he only wished that uh, uh, it would be worth a million dollars if the devil would come to me. Uh, and tell me every evening, as he does to James Gordon Bennett, what the people of New York would like to read the next morning, because he found out what people wanted to read. It's funny, Charles Krauthammer, the late columnist, uh, said that Rupert Murdoch and Fox News discovered a niche market in American broadcasting, half the American people. Well, James Gordon Bennett did that for New York newspaper readers. He found out what people wanted to read and he provided it to them. And they read his paper by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and it was news. You could call it sensationalism, uh, but he gave them the news that they wanted to read and he revolutionized journalism in New York. Wow. I was so happy to find Thomas Downing in your book. Um, his is truly a remarkable New York story. I actually wanted to write a book about him, but there was too little archival material to draw on. But talk to us about Downing and also the role oysters played in New York. People don't realize that uh, oysters were a giant industry in New York. Everyone ate oysters. They were the size of Frisbees, actually. And of course, now we're trying to seed oyster beds in New York for two reasons. One, to purify the water and two, eventually, so we can eat them again in clean water. But Thomas Downing came from the South and he became an oyster man. Oyster men uh, were predominantly black, uh, and but he became a upscale oyster man. And he became uh, someone who catered to uh, upscale audiences. Uh, most of his uh, uh, consumers were white. They ate in his restaurants. They ate with him at his table. And um, uh, it was very interesting because they treated him as something of an equal, not entirely, of course, uh, but for someone in the 1820s, 1830s, he was regarded as uh, something more than just a free black man in New York City. Uh, he was a man of some influence, a man of some distinction, uh, a man who had uh, whose opinion was was taken uh, seriously. He also uh, had a really elegant restaurant, right? Oh, and yes. Where, where all of the restaurant. socialites and politicians and the who's who uh, would gather, right? And Absolutely. Charles Dickens, when he came to New York, would, would right. die. The, the biggest celebration for Charles Dickens when he came to New York was at uh, Peyton's Restaurant. And uh, people consumed vast amounts of oyster. Uh, and it was just fascinating to see him become part of that New York social scene, uh, even though he was black at the time. And it also reminds us there was a free black community in New York uh, 
that was relatively prosperous. And in Lower was, Manhattan is where they lived too, right? Near, right. Like in the and, area of his restaurant. And, you know, wasn't exactly part of the New York social scene, but certainly was accepted uh, somewhat politically, but certainly socially uh, and taken seriously. And it, it said that in, in the basement of his restaurant, he was also operating the Underground Railroad, right? He was indeed. I'm not sure how many of his white friends uh, were associated. <laughs> Probably there. none of them, right? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, yeah. But it was known that uh, uh, he uh, certainly, he was not openly supporting abolitionists. No. Which was important because people like James Gordon Bennett who was a friend and to whom he actually loaned money for exactly. his newspaper were very much anti-abolitionist. Exactly. Uh, but what uh, Downing did was support black schools, which people like James Gordon Bennett thought was okay. It's okay to educate blacks, mm -hmm. just not to let them escape slavery to the North, where they would compete with poor wage uh, Irish and other immigrants. Yeah. And speaking of oysters, you revealed that Ellis Island had been called Little Oyster Island until it was named after the man who had owned it. But um, the, the reason why we know this is because you were telling us about the first immigrant to disembark there in 1892. So tell us about her. Well, what's so interesting about that story was that, you know, typical foundational myths of America tells the story of Annie Moore, who was the first person on Ellis Island when it opened as a federal immigration center in 1892. Annie Moore landed there from Ireland. Uh, she joined her family briefly on the Lower East Side, and then the family moved to Texas, where she got hit, hit by a streetcar and died, uh -huh. except the story wasn't true. Uh, we found out that uh, that was a made-up story that wasn't Annie Moore who died in Texas, but it, it wasn't. wasn't it wasn't Moore. our Annie Moore. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't our Annie Moore. Our Annie Moore stayed on the Lower East Side all her life. We discovered, and was the uh, her progeny intermarried with all sorts of other ethnic groups and became this all-American, typical American dream kind of family. And until I think maybe the past decade or two, there were still relatives of her living on the Lower East Side of New York. And wow. it was just a fascinating story that tells all about America. It really is. Another uh, woman who you, you bring up is Eliz Elizabeth Jennings, oh, one another of my little known New Yorker who I've actually uh, written about, but talk about her place in New York and in really in American history. Um, you know, Pamela, she amazed me because Elizabeth Jennings was a school teacher uh, on a Sunday morning uh, in the 1850s. She was on her way to church on the Lower East Side to play the organ. She was late. So she hailed a trolley, a Third Avenue trolley downtown. Uh, she was very audacious. She tried to board the trolley. It was a whites only trolley and she got thrown off. And she sued the trolley company. She hired a young lawyer. His name was Chester Arthur. He later became the president of the United States. And she went to Brooklyn Supreme Court and she won. She won her case. The judge said, you can't keep a woman off a trolley if she's respectable. She's well dressed if she's behaved. This was 1854, a hundred years before Rosa Parks. Exactly. And virtually no one ever heard of this woman. Mm -hmm. Finally, a group of students in an elementary school got a street corner named after her. But Elizabeth Jennings was virtually unknown to people for having done this bold, audacious, precedent-setting move a hundred years before Rosa Parks. She didn't get an obituary in the New York Times. Right. And I thought a person like that who made such a groundbreaking, pioneering move deserved to be recognized in this book. Absolutely. Your account of the scandalous Bradley Martin Ball, 
was so delicious. I just love that story. So um, what was it, this ball, and who were they, and what became of them? Well, I can believe people could be so tone deaf. <laughs> tone <laughs> deaf? <laughs> people, uh, people, Bradley Martin and his wife, and there was a recession going on at the end of the 19th century. And I describe them in the book as having ended the Gilded Age because they said, well, how are we going to help this? What can we do to make things better? And Mrs. Martin, who decided to change the family name to Bradley Martin, taking her husband's first name away, uh, said, we're going to run a costume party and we're going to organize it very quickly so people can't get their costumes abroad. They're going to have to get them in New York City. We're going to hold it at the old Waldorf Astoria, which is at the, was at the site of what is now the Empire State Building. And they created the most lavish party imaginable at the end of the 19th century, put every other party, party to shame. And it became the laughing stock of not only New York and the country, it was covered on the front page lead story of almost every newspaper in the country. It was the height of excess. And with Bradley was Martin, it wasn't it covered even in Britain in the UK? All over the place. Yeah. All over the place as this most ridiculous uh tribute to excess. The family had to move to England because they were so <laughs> embarrassed by it. And as I say, it virtually ended the Gilded Age because it was such an embarrassment. Goodness. One of my favorite characters in your book was Clara Limlick, another person I had never heard of, nor had I heard of the uprising of 10,000. So tell us about her and how you came across her story. Well, she was a garment worker. Uh, she came uh, from uh, Russia. She spoke only Yiddish at the time, or mostly Yiddish. And she worked in a sweatshop with other uh, Jewish immigrants and Italian immigrants. And uh, she had to fight against the owners of the sweatshops and against the male leaders of the garment workers union, who said, you know, what do you women know? Uh, you're not ready to go on strike. You don't have the stamina. You don't have the gumption. And she got up at a strike meeting on Cooper Union, the auditorium that Abe Lincoln spoke at in 1860 when he was trying to win the Republican nomination for president. Right down the street from where I am right now. <laughs> That's right. And she said, we've got to go out and strike. We've taken enough from these people. It's time for us to go out. And she lit a spark under the garment workers and they went out and struck and were out on the street in the winter for four months and they won their strike. They didn't win everything. They got the 54 hour week cut down. Uh, they won some safety measures, which eventually were strengthened after the Triangle shirtwaist fire a couple of years later in what Francis Perkins, who later became the Secretary of Labor, said, this was the real start of the New Deal. Uh, but she got up there, this almost illiterate woman uh, on her own and rallied the workers uh, to start this strike and made labor history. And, and why don't and why didn't we know her her before now? Because there were better known people, some of the union leaders per se, some of the rich socialized socialites who aligned themselves with the union leaders, and she was a virtual unknown. And then she sort of faded away because she got blackballed by the owners, and she couldn't even get a job. She couldn't even get a pension from the union because she hadn't worked you know, a certain number of days or a certain number of years, and she just faded into history. And I thought she deserved, like so many others in this book, the recognition, uh, the fact that she was overlooked. And that's why in a biography of the city, of the New Yorkers, I think you know, she was one of those people who really needed the recognition that, uh, uh, that she ought to have had. And she probably didn't get a no bit either, right? No, she did not. Yeah. Um, you talk about so many other people like that. Um, there's uh, Philip Payton Jr. who- um, The man who made Harlem. Right. Uh, like he's more, like the Andrew Green of, of Black Harlem, right? He, he made Black Harlem and he did it yeah. 
by totally outwitting the white real estate owners. Uh, he said, I'm going to put blacks in the neighborhood, and if you don't like it, all your white tenants can move out. And what he did was turn the tables on the white real estate owners. And the Times had headlines of, you know, race war in Harlem because he was putting black tenants in and they were paying more. But he was buying up, he was buying up the land and then renting it to That's African right. Americans, yeah. right? You know, it turned out he overextended himself, but he really created black Harlem by buying and building uh, apartments and moving in black tenants who were being shunned and shut out of other neighborhoods in Manhattan. Yeah. Do you have a favorite New Yorker or episode? Well, I, I have a couple, but one of my favorites, sort of, is Audrey Munson. Mm. Uh, no one ever heard of Audrey Munson. The, the model, right? You look, <laughs> if you look all over Manhattan, you can see her face. If you look at the main monument at the southwest corner of Central Park, if you look at the Pulitzer Fountain in Grand Army Plaza, if you can look high enough at the uh, statue of civic fame on top of the municipal building, there is the face of Audrey Munson. She was one of the most famous sculptors model uh, in the 19 teens. She was the first person to appear nude in motion pictures. Uh, and she figured in a love triangle murder case. Uh, she attempted suicide. She uh, was committed to an insane asylum. Uh, she died in the 1990s at the age of 104. Uh, she was called Miss Manhattan because she was the model for the figure Miss Manhattan at the entrance to the Manhattan Bridge. And I figured what better model for a Miss Manhattan than someone who embodied all of these weirdo quirky features than this Audrey Munson. Uh, and it was just so bizarre. And uh, you know, this this person just appealed to me on so many levels. And there she was, Audrey Munson, who again did not get an obituary in the New York Times. And yet she was the most famous model of her time in the 19 teens and 1920s. And again, how did you come upon her name? Because like just looking and doing research. But and a sculptor's and model, uh, oftentimes you don't know, like you see statues all the time and you don't know who the model was no so. looking through pictures and saying you know who is yeah. that person who is yeah. that face yeah. uh you know if if um helen of troy was the face that launched a thousand ships i thought audrey <laughs> munson was the face that launched a thousand quips <laughs> no it's, it's a great story so um i don't know uh do we have any questions out there because i don't want to monopolize the entire hour uh i don't see any questions so Unless I see something, I'm going to just keep going. What surprise? A question out there. Yeah, someone. If you do, put it in the chat. So, what surprised you most? Like, was there a revelation that that surprised you, um, saddened you, <laughs> delighted you? Well, one of the things that surprised me is, you know, again, this relates to our lack of context, our lack of perspective. We've gone through so many crises in the city. 9-11, uh, certainly, you know, the biggest in our lives, I think, and the pandemic, of course. But, you know, without wallowing in our history, we kind of forget that uh, the city has been very resilient. Uh, we've gone through very major things before. That fire in 1776, the British occupation, Two thirds of the city was destroyed. Uh, the Civil War draft riots, the flu epidemic of 1919. Uh, that doesn't mean we're always going to survive. And, you know, we have to realize if we don't worry about our condition, uh, we're not going to react sufficiently to it. But right. we have survived. And one of the reasons we've survived that we often forget is because of the influx of the immigrants. And, you know, while this city, like the rest of the country, has been ambivalent about immigrants in many periods, it's been immigrants coming here that have revived the city. And that's happening again. Uh, maybe that growth has slowed a little right now because of recession, uh, because of uh, national policy toward immigrants. 
but the city is now at a record population. Well, right. th well, thanks to uh, Texas and Florida, we just oh. got a new influx of yeah, that's true. bus well, loads of immigrants. Involuntarily, right? perhaps, <laughs> but, it, but it's true. Uh, and you look at places in Brooklyn, you look at places in the South Bronx where people are coming in and neighbors that are being revitalized and housing is being built. And it's absolutely remarkable. And I think that is the lifeblood of this city. It always has been. Okay. Now you look at vacant office space and retail space and you say, my God, how is this going to be revived? I don't know the answer to that, but I have faith that somehow it will be. Yeah. I, people always write off New York and they come out looking silly. Like, don't write off New York, right? Um, so the questions are rolling in. Um, who would have been 32? <laughs> I'm sorry. Who, Who would, have would have been, been number 32? <laughs> well, I, I say to people, it's the person they would have suggested. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there are so many people I could have chosen. There are so many people I left out. Uh, again, uh, people say, why didn't you pick so-and-so or that person? Why didn't you pick uh, some more recent immigrants? Uh, and I again, I didn't want to pick anyone who was still alive because I didn't have a sense of how important they might be 20 or 30 or 50 years from now. Uh, but uh, I think there are a lot of people who could have qualified, certainly uh, more immigrants from Asia and Latin America, I think could have qualified because- And someone, and someone did ask, was, yeah, was there anyone of Asian descent in the book? Uh, no, there was not. And, uh, you know, a fair point, I think, there could have been. Uh, the last person in the book is a, a immigrant whose family is from the Caribbean. Uh, and I think that is indicative of an influx that is certainly reviving uh, parts of upper Manhattan, Brooklyn and the South Bronx. Uh, but, you know, I think that is indicative of a new wave. Uh, but, you know, you can only include so many. I hate to admit something you would empathize with. 80,000 words. Hey. Oh, uh, that hurt. <laughs> exactly. That, that hurt. hurt. That was bloodletting. So, yeah. So in, in, in that bloodletting, who do you really regret having to, to leave out? I don't want to name names. Oh, you can't name one. That's, I don't that's want to hurt question. anyone's feelings because I might be able to include them in the next one. Okay. So, but, so you do have some regrets, right? Yes, People absolutely. Who, absolutely. Who I would have had more. 31, as I say, was an arbitrary number. I just had to stop someplace. Yeah. Well, there were about a billion people, according to demographers, who have ever lived in New York at one time or another. I admit I didn't go through all billion as a pool. <laughs> the pool yeah. was pretty big. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the most current person featured in the book? I know one is well, like Preston Crest, Wilcox. Carmelia Goff. Who was uh -huh. one of the people uh, who lived in uh, Van Dyke houses in Brooklyn, one of the giant housing projects that, interestingly enough, was built with the best intentions in mind. It was a high rise project in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And it was one of those projects with a giant high crime rate because it couldn't be policed, uh, it couldn't be looked at in the way Jane Jacobs wanted people to have their eyes on the street because it was so high, so massive, but it was built that way so that it would have more green space between the buildings. Didn't work. Uh, and she was lucky enough to be able to bid for a, uh, an apartment, a house in one of the Nehemiah housing projects that was built by East Brooklyn congregations. She got that house. She managed to bid for it for $49,000 in 1982, she moved into it. Uh, it is now worth $550,000, which if her family ever sells it, they are entitled to reap that profit. Uh, she died, unfortunately, a few years ago. She became president of the Brownsville Nehemiah Homeowners Association. That may not be a model, a panacea for every affordable housing project in the city, because it is so low density. But what it proved was what grassroots organization in New York City can do. It showed what this grassroots group of East Brooklyn congregations people could do. I was out there 
last week at a meeting of the East Brooklyn congregations, and it showed the spirit of these people, what they were able to do in that community. And it shows how alive this community is, how spirited it is, and how New York came back from, I remember Brownsville in the 70s and 80s. Oh, I do too. It was, it was like burned, burned. it was burned out. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And yeah. now it's a neighborhood of, you know, lower middle class people and shows that that can come back. Yeah, you also wrote about uh, Preston Wilcox in, in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. Another and, person, Pamela, who I never heard of. Mm -hmm. He was the philosophical godfather of decentralization, mm -hmm. community control decentralization. And the parallel I discovered there was his concept of decentralization was in effect the same philosophy that Cardinal John Hughes came up with in the beginning of the 19th century, mm -hmm. when he wanted parochial schools for Catholics, right. for Irish Catholic immigrants. Mm -hmm. So we think of, you know, Blacks wanting community control of the schools in the 1960s, uh, that this is a racial message, this is Black power. But it was the same thing that the Roman Catholic uh, Archbishop of New York, John Hughes, was looking for for Irish immigrants in the beginning of the 19th century, and very few people had drawn that parallel. Yeah. Um, another interesting question. Did um, Green use eminent domain when he displaced the uh, Blacks who lived in Seneca Village? He probably point? did, except for the fact that, uh, as far as I understand, they didn't own it. They were kind of squatters uh, for the most part. That was either city land or uh, unapportioned land. Uh, but I thought Seneca extent. Village also had businesses. It had, I well, mean, it, some it, it, was it was similarly what happened at um, Lincoln Center. when. So, well, Lincoln Center thousands. definitely, definitely yeah. but under Robert Moses was land that was appropriated uh, right. for urban renewal. In fact, uh, the appropriation was delayed so they could film West Side Story there, right. uh, interestingly enough. But Seneca Village, if I, my understanding is correct, and I'm not that familiar with it, a lot of that, uh, a lot of the land that Central Park uh, was being acquired from uh, was not uh, necessarily property owned. Seneca Village might have been an exception, though. Yeah. And um, someone else wrote, I encourage my granddaughter to write about other people besides the obvious heroes. Who are your favorite heroes in the book? Well, I think, you know, what you've got to do is go out, your granddaughter, whatever age she is and whatever she is in school, should go out and look at her own neighborhood and see who the heroes were and are. And also, you know, if she wants to read that objects book, look at the quirky objects that have affected her neighborhood. I put in things like the air conditioner. Now, you wouldn't think an air conditioner had that big an impact in New York. But the air conditioner allowed people to move to the south and were, was responsible for that way, demographic wave of people moving out of New York. Uh, I think that was a very important thing. So you look at things in your neighborhood that made a difference, things you might ordina not ordinarily pick. So use your imagination when you're in your neighborhood and look at, at the 27 buildings book. I picked a bank that is, not, that is now a laundromat in the South Bronx. That bank started the bank run that began the depression in the 1930s. Now it's a laundromat. People walk by that every day and have no idea what it is. There's an ATM machine in the laundromat from which you can get money. In the 1930s, you couldn't withdraw your money from that bank because the bank was broke. I mean, there is an example of a building that made history that nobody knows about in a neighborhood in the South Bronx. So use your imagination. So I'm going to try to squeeze in these two last questions. One is, are native New Yorkers born and raised becoming a rarity, in your opinion? No, I don't think so. Uh, one of the fascinating things about this book is that almost every one of the 31 New Yorkers in the New Yorkers came from somewhere else came from somewhere else. And I have a quote from E.B. White, the New Yorker essayist, who says, no one should come to New York to live, 
unless he or she is willing to be lucky. And these people made their luck. And I venture to say that New York became the luckier city because they came here. Yeah. So so you don't take special pride in being a native New Yorker? Uh, I am glad I am a native <laughs> New Yorker. I think I am lucky for having been a native New Yorker. Yeah, I, I feel that way too. And I, and I, but I do, I do believe that um, we're becoming more and more of a rarity as New York becomes so expensive and, and so many um, of the native New Yorkers are, are priced out. Well, that may um, be and, true, but it's always been a city that has been churning its population. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, another question was looking at what you've learned, what does it portend for our future? What might we as a city do to improve things for all who live here? Well, I think the most important thing we have to do is, is find a way to build affordable housing and define affordable housing in a way that it is genuinely affordable. When we talk about affordable housing, a family of four making $100,000, I don't think that's affordable uh, for many people or not for enough people. And it's a very difficult formula to come up with in terms of tax abatements, in terms of all sorts of other things, in terms of increasing the density of housing in a way that people will say uh, they don't mind it in their backyard. Uh, but that's a thing we've got to reconcile in a way that we could do it and not make everyone happy, but at least make everyone accept it as a fact of life if we're going to keep this city uh, going the way it is. Any final thoughts about these people, our city? I think it's a great city. I think this city will survive. I think it will thrive. And I invite people to nominate more candidates for the sequel to this book. <laughs> well, I'm sure that there are many. You probably already have another book out of the people you had to leave out. And, uh, and those, so. those 80,000 words. Um, any final thoughts about su a surprise, like one big surprise? Um, the big surprise is I'm working on another book and I hope people enjoy that one too. <laughs> so no surprise from your research? Like there was no like fact that surprised you? Well, I'm working on a book that says America began in New York. Uh, okay. It goes back to the question of history and people again don't realize how much of American history began right here in this city. And I'm hoping to make that case. Yeah, and I think maybe... And, and make that case in time for 2026, which is arguably the country's 250th birthday. Wow, that sounds like a great book, Sam. Thank and you. And maybe, you, maybe, maybe over the next few years, you could also begin a campaign for a marker project, like because... I think in other cities like Boston, you do have so many markers, right, of where something happened in, you know, that was important to history. Same in Philadelphia. I think more people think of um, the federal government being based in Philadelphia than they do in New York. I know I do. And we should have a market trail, a freedom trail, beginning with the Lenape Indians as well. Oh, another fascinating fact. You say that they actually, you think of indigenous as coming from here, but they came from Asia? Yeah. I mean, everyone in New York came from somewhere else. I know, but when we think of Native Americans, <laughs> so they were the first people, and but they- everyone but they, in Asia came from Africa. Right. We all came from Africa, right? The human race. Well, thank you so much, Sam. I, Like I said, I could talk to you all night. This book is amazing. Thank and you. I, and thank you to the Center for Brooklyn History. And, and thank, I just want to thank you both, Sam, your, your enthusiasm is infectious. I only wish that your encyclopedic knowledge, you know, was as infectious. You know so much. It's incredible. I learned um, something every day. <laughs> um, thank you both. This was a fascinating, fascinating conversation. I, I want to thank the audience for being here. Um, this was recorded and will be on the Center for Brooklyn History. History's uh, public programs YouTube channel uh, tomorrow, and um, we hope we'll see you at future programs. <laughs>